Hey, good Thursday morning, everybody. Eric Kane, Rob Lewis, Brent Hubs, and Awesome Price here on the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast, presented each and every week by our friends, Exterior Home Solutions. Whatever the case may be, you want some renovations, siding, windows, roof, decking, additions, maybe. Uh, whatever the case may be for you, give Exterior Home Solutions a call. They can help you out. A free estimate, 865-524-5888, or find them online at ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. Busy week for Tennessee football. Media day was on Tuesday. First practice was yesterday. Practice number two coming up here later this morning. And uh, with that, bring some questions, and we'll start with 615 Vol. Jordan Thomas, is he going to be a factor this year other than special teams? Austin Price. I, I do think he's going to play in the back end. Now, does that mean two series of game hubs? Does that mean full starts? I, I don't know. I don't think – any of us know at this point, but I do think that uh, he will be more of a factor in the back end than he was a year ago and, and be more than just a special teams guy. Yeah, I think it all depends on, you know, how open is really that competition at the safety spot, Rob. You know, I think Wesley Walker's got one of them nailed down. If he stays healthy, the question is how big of a competition is that or isn't it at the other spot with Jay McCullough and, and somebody else? Um that's that's the unknown. I think Jordan Thomas has got the ability to play. Um, he needs to show himself. Excuse me. In the fall, he needs to show himself in fall camp. Uh, but but there's no doubt he's got some talent to be able to help Tennessee in the back end. Yeah, I mean, it, we, we saw day one of, of of camp on Wednesday. I don't want to make too much of it at all. It just you saw we saw a little bit of eleven on eleven work, and I mean, it, judging from that, it looks like it's an open competition at safety. I mean, they. It didn't. It didn't appear that guys were just penciled in because they had started there in the past, or you know, played a lot of football in the, for Tennessee in the past. Yeah. Whereas you know the who the two you know linebackers are going to be the first snap of the game. You know pretty much the the bulk of that defensive line, even though it's very rotational. Uh, secondary, I think it's open competition season, and it might end up being the same guys. But again, I'll I'll continue to go back and say, can you play more that way? If someone's getting beat, you don't have to keep them out there. We'll have to find out. Uh, Smoky Man 15 wants to know who took advantage of summer conditioning. Who passed the eye test uh, in day one, Brent Hubbs? Well, those linebackers for, for sure. I mean, Arian Carter and Jeremiah T uh, T Lander were, I mean, they look like upperclassmen running around out there. So they, they, they caught my eye. Look, Dominic Bailey looked as good as he's ever looked in, in a Tennessee uniform, um, you know, going, running around on the practice field. Uh, th those two jumped out at I me. Mean, I think Ethan Davis uh, looks the part. Um, I, I think Ethan Davis may be the most important newcomer, freshman newcomer on this team for this fall because I think he has to play. I, I don't think it's a situation where necessarily you're going to try to ease him into it. I, I think he's got to be ready for, you know, from the jump, given their lack of depth at the tight end position. I think I said that in a two-minute drill, and I'll probably beat that point home a little bit. I think he's really vital for Tennessee. I, I thought he, he looked apart. I mean, Overall, Rob Austin, you guys jump in, and, and I know there's all this talk about two years ago and all that stuff. I mean, they lost 30 guys two years ago. They should look different. But even to the casual observer out there, the buzz on, on Wednesday on the practice field was it's a better-looking football team, and I think we all agree upon that, right? Uh, 100%. Rob, I mean, for years and years and years, everybody wrote about the strength coach. Nobody writes about Kurt. And I don't know if there's been a strength coach do as good a job since John Stuckey. I mean, like, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, maybe Johnny Long because he, you know, kind of that same that same family. But, I mean, like, this guy has transformed bodies better than anybody on this campus in a long time. I mean, not just the freshmen, but, I mean, the guys that have been here. I mean, everybody looks drastically different. They're putting on the right kind of weight. It's not like they're getting, like – fatty muscles like they're, they're like they're staying lean but being ripped i mean it's it's really impressive to kind of see some of the transformations yeah i mean and i think you can see it in a lot of positions i mean just and, and a lot of it's young i mean who knows you know what, what kind of impact it's going to make but just like hubbard's talking about the eye test you can see the edges with you know pierce and joseph's being a year in the program caleb herring looks like a long-limbed sec edge guy I mean, Dante, you don't think about receiver being a physical position. But I mean, Dante Thornton is a dude. I mean, that that guy jumps out at me. Like like Hubbard said, Ethan Davis. I mean, Okoye is, you know, in, 
just incredibly raw. But I mean, he's another guy that 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 jumps out at you physically. I mean, Elijah Hare and Caleb Perry, you know, a year in the in the weight room, those two guys look like, you know, thumpers, SEC linebackers. I mean, it's and you can just keep on going down the list. Khalifa Keith looked good. Yep, I, he's yeah, thick. you're right. I mean, it, it, he. I mean, Cam Selden, we knew was big. Keith, I think everybody thought, okay, that's kind of a bowling ball. But dude, he's ripped. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, you know, he's been doing body by Jake or something over the offseason. I mean, he's he's <laughs> he looks drastically different. Tyree Weathersby as well. Of course, he wasn't here in spring. Um, we'll move on in a moment. But uh, going back to Emmanuel Koye, uh, you know, day one. It was a late signee, you know, wasn't here in spring and all that. Uh, Austin, I just looked at him first time I've seen him in person this weekend. He just looked like an edge guy to me. I know he's playing tight end, and they'll figure it out down the line, but he's long. Uh, he, he looked like an edge guy to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be the natural reaction because, you know, he was labeled as an edge slash tight end, right? Yeah. And Tennessee needs the help at tight end now because, as the, you know, as Hubs specifically, you know, and I think astutely said, you know, Ethan Davis is in his importance just because since he's so thin there. But you never know when you may have to turn to an Emmanuel Okoye um, in some form or fashion. I mean, probably not. I mean, just because he's so super raw and they can enroll with a couple of those guys that are walk-ons turned, you know, serviceable guys ahead of him. But, you know, still, I mean, he is a freak athlete. And, uh, you know, if he can pick up the route running, if he can pick up the ability to, to catch the ball with his hands, um, you know, I mean, who knows? I mean, he's definitely got uh, a, a certain look to him. And I think everybody's, you're right, everybody's going to look at him and go, oh, the guy comes off the edge. Well, yeah, we'll go to you with this one. About go ahead, Brent. The interesting thing about Akoy, he put on a football for the first time about six or seven months ago. I mean, the, the guy's never played, essentially never played football. I mean, he, he is, he's, this was his first time practicing on a field with hash marks in his career because he's only played football for about six months. So, I mean, the, the learning curve for him outside of the physical stuff is as drastic as we've seen anybody have a learning curve uh, coming into it to a football program. I mean, Jakob Johnson played American football. He played a, high, a year of high school football, uh, even though he was a part of NFL Europe over there. And and Constantine Ritzman was an exchange student who played a year of American football. This has not been the case with Okoye. So there's a huge, steep learning curve for him mentally, We'll see how quickly he adjusts to that stuff as they dive into football here. I'd imagine his head swimming big time this week. It's like when we brought Grant Ramey from 24-7 to on three. I mean, there, there's just a learning curve. Learning curve. <laughs> Someone in He's the uh, thread for, the, for, <laughs> for two weeks in a row has said is, is asked the question, how much of a blessing is it to work with Grant Ramey every single day? I love the persistence. Grant it, told me to it, say that it's the worst thing in the world to move on. So. It, it's 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 a huge blessing. The best is when Grant pulls that dry sense of humor out, like you know, and he kind of gives you that kind of smirk, like I got you, you know. <laughs> All right, let's go to the seven maxims. What's your best guess on what the offensive line looks like this year? Do we see a huge drop off with the departures of Jerome Carvin and Darnell Wright? Rob, day one, there was some mixing and matching, but I think the biggest one of the biggest takeaways from day one. Gerald Mincy was running with the twos on the left side while it was J.J. Crawford and Dane Davis on the right side. Yeah, that, that's the biggest takeaway. I mean, everybody, everybody's looking at that you know, that right tackle spot to see how it's going to shake out. And, and um, you know, that, that makes some sense to me. You know, and, I'm, and I'm sure they'll cross-train, you know, some, some of those guys. But, you know, with, with Mincy having played there, you know, last year, I, I, I thought it was odd to move both those guys. I mean, when you did have Dane Davis who, you know, we had played some before, but um, yeah, John Campbell out there, out there at left tackle. It looks like they're you know hoping that he's going to be a plug and play guy. Um, Ollie Lane at, at that one guard spot that you know I think I know Brent's been saying for a while he thought that would, that's how that one was going to work out. Uh, but you know, the, to answer the one part of the question, I mean, no no disrespect to you know Jeremiah Crawford or anybody else, but yeah, I mean Darnell Wright was the, the tenth overall pick of the draft. There's going to be a drop off at, at right tackle. <laughs> I think it was a bit of drop off at guard because I think Jerome Carvin was yeah. undervalued because of his durability and he could also swing over and play center. He he was tough, hard nosed, physical football player. So I mean, there's, you know, we'll see what they grow and mesh into. No no question. I mean, Spragan should be better. We think that you know May should even be better than he's been. Uh, but to, to fill those two holes, I mean, 
I think Jerome Carter's got a shot of making the Chiefs roster. And Darnell Wright uh, um, is a freak athlete who is, has turned himself into a great football player. I mean, that was – I mean, Austin called that when he – that's that's Austin from a long time ago. I mean, everybody kind of jokes about it, the fact that he, he did the wide receiver workout, which is that he messed that up. But what's even more impressive is that he crushed the wide receiver conditioning out – the Chicago Bears at 325 pounds or whatever his weight is right now. Tells you how freak of an athlete that guy is. They're going to miss that athletic ability and his play for sure. Yeah, they are. I, I, go ahead. Sorry, Hippie, just state the obvious, but it, I mean, it's an incredible luxury when up front you never, ever have to worry about giving a guy help, ever. I mean, it's just you, – you just, you just don't worry about that one spot. Even, you know, even if you're – you know, playing against a first round NFL draft pick in the SEC on the edge, as you are, you know, a lot of Saturdays. I mean, Tennessee never had to worry about giving Darnell right help. Yeah. And, and the, the one thing I think you have to remember here is a year ago, you know, Darnell was playing the right side. So, like, in theory, like, they may not be as good on the right side, but Campbell, I think, has the potential to definitely be better than where they were on the left side a year ago at left tackle. So it just may it may the, – the, the the strength of the line may shift, right? You know, I mean, last year it was kind of fairly steady. You had Darnell, who was just such an anchor on the right side. But Carvin was at left guard, so it kind of balanced it out a little bit. Does it kind of tip back more to the left side this year if Campbell is who they hope he is? Let's go to Sport of All. Austin, this is for you. Two and a half is the number over under the commitments for the month of August. Under. <laughs> That's easy. I mean, like, you know, I mean, if everything went perfect, I'm not sure they get to three. And yeah. that's, you know, with, you know, Winnery coming off the board and then, you know, Amari Jefferson's got his decision. But, again, I mean, nothing's changed there for me with with, with AJ. So, I mean, you know, I don't see you – know, Koye's not coming off the board right now. Jordan Ross is coming off the board right now. I, I Ryan Wingo continues to insist he's going to go till December. I think there's an outside shot that changes. And, and you know, he, he does something at some point before December. But, you know, we'll see. Again, like I think he could say, okay, I'm going to commit next Tuesday, and by next Tuesday could go, yeah, I'm back to December. Because we look at Jordan Ross. He's kind of been like, you know, I'm going to go earlier, then I'm going all the distance, then I'm going earlier, then I'm going the distance, a lot of waffling. Um, I just don't think there's going to be that many guys decide in August they could get over two and a half. Let's say with you, Austin, got a couple of recruiting ones here from Athron. Uh, what is the total number of high school uh, kids taken in this recruiting class? Would you Would you guess? I don't know because I don't, and, and it doesn't matter because the numbers eighty eight. Well, if, if you're going off the number of eighty three or eighty two, because you know, they can self impose. But I mean, that's the number. Like it doesn't matter how many they take. Um, it, it's just you know they could take thirty two. They could take twenty two. Um, I, I think it's probably somewhere between twenty two and twenty five. I think it depends on who wants in, Hubs. I mean, like, you know, they get the right one or two guys, give them a buzz, get the right one or two guys jump in. Um, they're not going to turn away good players uh, because they don't have to, and they can, you know, make the decision on, you know, scholarship availability after this season. Well, and also, you know, you got guys leaving your program. Um, you got guys you could encourage to leave your pro program. <laughs> you can say, hey, we got more, we got more guys we, who want in. We're going to take high school more than we are for four guys this year. I mean, that's all about that catchphrase management right now. And and that number is, is such a fluid number. Nobody can answer that question right now. All right. Uh, thoughts on where Tennessee stands with Chris Cole? Um, You know, I, they've done enough to be in it. Um, I don't think they've done enough to this point to say that they're the favorite. Um, I think that, that, you know, they continue to, you know, you know, move in, in, in a positive direction with him. But again, like, I, I don't think that any, by any stretch of the imagination, I think I put what 50% in the, in the chat, you know, that's based off of, you know, I think it's Tennessee or Georgia, but I mean, there are some people that swear that, that, that he doesn't care to make that, you know, that trip to Miami and his mom will go watch him play down there in Miami. And if that's the case, then you can't discount the Canes because, you know, they do have a tendency to swing big on a, you know, you know, on a player or two in each class. And, you know, sometimes, you know, they're going to land. All right. If uh, Amari Jefferson goes to Alabama as expected, is there another wide receiver targets Tennessee gets in with that's not named Ron Wingo? It's Cam Michael. You know, Matt said that in the Monday night chat, and that, that's absolutely accurate. That would be 
that would be the uh, fourth guy. You know, based off, let's say that Tennessee was able to do enough to land Ryan Wingo, the potential fourth guy would be Cam Michael. And otherwise, I think they just go to the portal. And AP, I mean, doesn't Georgia want him as a, as a DB? They do. That's right, Rob. Just, yeah. I mean, I mean, I remember talking to Matt, you know, I guess after the Memorial Day thing, and I mean, he doesn't really play. I mean, he primarily plays offense in high school. I, mean, I just wonder how big of a factor that is. I mean, I think he would prefer to play offense. Um, but there is that allure to stay in state and play for the two-time defending sure. national champion. So, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, what wins out? The position – that you'd like to play or just, you know, being closer to home, you know, staying in state, the playing a position that you are okay with, but you know, it's not your first love. We'll go next down to Uptown Vol. What are your next movements in conference expansion realignment, Brent Hubs? Well, I think the question is, all right, I'm going to take the PAC 12 out of the equation because that doesn't affect the SEC, but that conference is, uh, I don't care what there. I mean, unless you're Oregon, you want to be, you know, one of the last, you know, last ones on the sinking ship, hoping you get the automatic playoff berth. I mean, at some point, you know, if that conference is not big enough, are they going to continue to get an automatic playoff berth? I think you got to wonder. It depends on what all happens there, but with the Pac-12, I think the biggest, the biggest question for SEC fans in terms of conference alignment is what happens with the ACC. Are people going to are, are schools member institutions of that league really going to get out of their deal? Are they really going to be able to pay the astronomical fee it is to get out of that? Um, if so, then does the SEC target some of those schools? I know Greg Sankey has said, "Hey, you, you know we're going to be very calculating here and and all these types of things." Where are they with some of the potential available ACC schools? if those guys can really get out. Now, the question is, are those schools going to be able to pay that kind of fee to, to get out of the conference, which seems like an astronomical. Well, well you've got, Hover, you, you've got, you know, on, on Wednesday, you had Dan Wetzel at Yahoo come out and say that the Big Ten has begun preliminary talks with Cal, Stanford, Washington, and Oregon. And that, that would seemingly – eliminate some of those ACC talks that, that everybody was talking about late last week, if that's the case. So that would be interesting because then that basically means that six of the Pac-12 <laughs> would be going headed to the Big Ten. And then you got Arizona and Colorado. looks like they're headed to the Big 12. And that thing's just obliterated to pieces at that point. Um, so it does then it yeah, does. It, it, you know, or does that, what happens with the ACC? Yeah, and Rob, I, the, the whole – the whole Pac-12 West Coast schools going to the Big Ten just just remains a head scratcher to me. Now I, they're just looking for a place to land, and the Big 12's got a big TV contract, so I get on the financial rewards and the Pac-10, the Pac-12 likes leadership, but which is causing this thing to fall apart. But but man, what how cost inefficient is it for an athletic department? to play the bulk of their game, you know, in middle America or on the East coast, when you, your, your home school is, is sitting somewhere in the middle of California. I mean, how much money is Cal going to spend to play volleyball and, and, and baseball and basketball just to travel, you know, to, to play, you know, to play in that conference. It's not just about football. It's all the other expenses. I mean, it's, it's got to be astronomical what the travel is going to be for USC and UCLA moving into the big, Yet already, yeah. I, I, that, I, that's the point I was going to bring up. Over is it's not. I mean, football. I mean, it, it's a long road trip to go from, you know, Cal to Rutgers. But you know, that, that's gonna. I mean, that's gonna pay for itself. But I mean, how much sense does it make to fly? Like Hubbard was saying, fly the volleyball team from you know from Berkeley to New Jersey, you know, to play a, a game that you know there's going to be maybe a hundred a hundred people in the gym. I mean, that's the kind of. I mean, you know, it's all about football. I totally get that. But it's, you know, if you're talking about the big picture for the student athlete, man, there are going to be some headaches. I, I just kind of envision it, Rob, like they're going to take all the secondary sports and put them on the plane like the, the Cleveland Indians rode on on Major League and then with the, <laughs> the storm. <laughs> and like, you know, it's just some clunker. Get, I mean, get in there, guys. We're going to get there as cheap as we can. <laughs> you get into some weather stuff and you're going to have – 
he would have Kevin's mom with John Candy in the back of a rental van trying to get home to 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 see to see them because you know you got a weather factor in the winter time with those sports that 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 the the Pac-12 never had to deal with before too. I mean, you know, you you got to get to you got to get to East Lansing, you got to get to wherever in the Big Ten in in January. It's not always the easiest case, so there's just a lot of variables there that that I think. See, I'm surprised at this because we've seen West Virginia said, you know, we made a mistake going to the big because it's so cost inefficient to do this. There's no loyalty. Our, our fans aren't into the big well because we're kind of the outcast on the other part of the country. But again, where are those schools on the West Coast supposed to go if the Pac-12 can't get a TV deal and can't put anything together financially to keep a conference together? I'm surprised maybe the Mountain West or somebody hasn't tried to, to swing in there and get one of those. I just, I guess they just can't offer enough money to justify doing that. The Kenosha Kickers, Hubs, they're very big in Sheboygan. <laughs> I knew you would play See, it. Well is, played. I mean, I just want – I mean, I, it's not the, – the volleyball, you know, Cal volleyball going to Rutgers is not, not going to be the reason this happens. But I wonder, Hubber, if you – guys, if you add a lot, a lot of that stuff up – about how inefficient and, and unfair it is to the students of the non-revenue producing sports to, you know, have to play a conference like that. I wonder if this isn't like the, the first little baby step on football kind of breaking away. Cause you know, and you know, the PAC 12 stayed intact for, you know, volleyball, baseball, softball, but then they're, they're in like this football super conference and, you know, the same thing for, you know, elsewhere around the country. I, I can, I mean, I, I think this is, I mean, I think we all feel like it's headed that way. I just don't know if the NCAA goes away completely, or if it's just football that, that breaks away. Well, it's like the it's like the high school team that is five A in football, you know, which would be triple A normally in, in basketball, but then somehow it's only two A in basketball, and they play totally different teams. You know, they play these massive schools in football, and then they play kind of more moderate teams in, in, in basketball. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't know if that's something that can happen. Um, but I mean, it just, so much of this just screams, it, it, it's got super, super massive flaws and holes in it because of the travel of, of all these other sports, not that they drive the train, but you know, you know, because of title nine and everything else, they're not going away either. So, I mean, like, you know, you're going to make those volleyball teams work and the golf team work and all that stuff. And it just becomes more of a, a head scratcher, I think. We got plenty more questions to get into, and uh, we got a lot of football camp recruiting questions. But first, a word from our proud sponsors, Exterior Home Solutions. Exterior Home Solutions will make one family's dream come true. Do you know a family in need of a new roof? Maybe it's leaking or needs repaired. Whatever the needs may be, Exterior Home Solutions is going to give one lucky family an exterior home makeover. To nominate a family that you think is deserving, simply go to the website at exteriorhomesolutions.com slash makeover and you can make your nomination there. Exterior Home Solutions wants to give the gift of home to one lucky family. Kick tubs out. If you don't know who the Kenosha kickers are, that they're big in Sheboygan, can't be on this podcast. All right, Kane, keep going with the questions. <laughs> I miss Denarius Moore. Wants to know who in this recru- who in this recruiting class do you think is in for a big senior season bump? I've already uh, saw that Jeremiah's Hurd got a pop with on three. Do you expect anybody to rise like Nathan Leacock? I mean, I think Gage Ginther will. Um, you know, uh, you know, and we'll and we'll see. Like, I, I'm not sure that there's some massive riser. You got to remember. I mean, like, you know, most of the class are you know four or five star guys. There's a couple that aren't, and you know, they're probably more along the lines of guys who. You know, our projects that you know, have the size or the speed or whatever, but, you know, don't play, you know, uh, in a great conference in high school. And there's some questions about, you know, that type of stuff. So, I mean, I'm not sure there's going to be some big massive jump like there was last year with Arion Carter, David Hobbs, uh, you know, some of those guys last year that kind of went from, you know, way out there to boom, five-star status. Yeah, I mean, this, AP, this is way more your jam than mine. But I, and, and I'm not talking about guys going from three to four or five stars. But just you know, Marcus Gorey being you know out, outside the three hundred, Spillman outside three hundred, and and, and Boo Carter. I, I could see those guys, you know, getting a pop. But again, they're they're already as AP pointed out, they're already four star dudes. Well, and, and and you know, with Boo, I mean, like you know, Boo went from playing you know double A private, which is just an okay league. 
Triple A profits ridiculous. Double A profits is an okay league. To now playing in six A, you know what? What does he do in that league? Because his the schedule week in week out is going to be tougher than what he had at, at you know Chattanooga Christian. So I'm I'm, I'm kind of interested if he if he does what I think he's capable of doing, then he should go back up in the rankings because his senior film against really decent competition will be pretty good. You know, I really hate that we had to get rid of Hubs for the second half of this podcast because this question is for him. It's from Rocky Top T. I think we win in the swamp. We're looking at nine wins or more. If we lose, I don't think we reach nine. I know everyone's saying we should win at Florida, but I'll believe it when I see it. Thoughts? Well, I mean, how can you argue that, Rob? I mean, yeah. they've not won there since 2003. I was still in college. Kane was like six, and, you know, I think he was 10, but like, I, you know, you know, and, and Rob, I think you had more pepper and less salt in your hair then. So, I mean, like, you know, I mean, it, it, long time that was ago. Mine, that was mine and Hubbard's first go around together, 2003. Yeah, long time ago. Casey Clawson, is that the, Casey Clawson to James Banks, halftime James Hail Mary? Banks. That's yeah. right. Absolutely. I, I think Tennessee went. I mean, I just, I, I get it. I mean, I've seen everything AP's seen down there. I mean, my God, I mean, some of those drives back to Orlando, AP, <laughs> that we've made just, you know, two hours of saying, I, can you believe we just saw that? Can you believe that oh, just happened? Listen, the, 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 you know, the fourth, the fourth and 26 or whatever was, you know, and what was, what year was that? 15. Um, and then, of course, the 17 Hail Mary. Yeah. That right. was, like, I literally said, Watch this. They're going to throw a Hail Mary. I don't know why I thought that, but I mean, like, you know, I, I said they're going to hit on the Hail Mary. And when the kid caught it, this this TV guy that covers Florida went and just looked at me. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, it, it, they Florida finds ways to just, you know, they, they slit Tennessee's ankles and Tennessee bleeds out for it, even knows that, that it was cut on. Like, I mean, like, it's, it's, uh, it's been mind boggling over the years. Now, again, Different group. These guys, you know, think differently. The Florida players, I think, still, you know, can still see the record and go, that we, we own this series. We should win this game. And, and they'll play that way. So, I mean, Tennessee's going to have to bring it in the swamp and get over that hump. And if they can win in the swamp this year, going to next year, you have a chance to get a little bit of a winning streak against Florida. And when that happens, then it really changes the, the complexion and, and the arc of the series, in my opinion. Yeah, I, you know, I, I this like might Tennessee's... be like a coach speak answer, but yeah, it's your first true road game, and it's it's a it's not week one. I get it, but it's a you know it's one of the first few games of the season. I just think it's Tennessee's most important game. It's it's on the road. All those reasons you just mentioned, your rival place you don't win at. If you win that game, boy, it, it sends you kind of sprinting down that schedule. If you lose that game, then it's like my God, you still got to play South Carolina to beat you last year, Alabama, Georgia later on the year, Kentucky. So that that's just a massive game, in my opinion. That being Florida in Week Three, I think it's a great time to be playing. I mean, it's it's a great time to be playing Florida early in the season. Yeah, new quarterback and in Mertz, a guy who you know was was a long way from being great at, at Wisconsin. Um, you know, some staff turnover down there. They're going to be still early in that. Very unsettled on the offensive line. Uh, I just. I mean, it's it, it's if if you if you don't get it this year in the swamp, then and you know there there really is something. You know, hubs might be onto something that it's just it's just a house of horrors. Yeah, well, it's been that very much so. I, yeah, if you're a Tennessee fan, you really want Utah to take it to Florida and 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 cause the finger pointing early on. All right, let's go around the room for this one. Vol for live TP has some preseason over unders. Dante Thornton, 999 and a half yards over or under. I'll say under. I'll say under, but it wouldn't shock me. I mean, somebody's yeah. going to, I mean, the short, you know, history tells us somebody's getting a thousand mm -hmm. at wide out. I'll go with McCoy, but I, I won't be remotely shot if, if Thornton. Same here. Goes. I'm going to go, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take the cop out answer. If he's healthy, I'm going over. The question is, is does the hamstring hold up all that stuff? Like, you know, if he stays on the field, I think he does get to there. Brew McCoy, 59 and a half catches. Over. I'll go over. Uh, I'll go over as well. Here's the caveat here. You're talking about Thornton a moment ago. Squirrel White, 549 yards over. receiving. I, I still say over. I, I see I mean, over. He had 480 last year as, as, yeah. a, as a part-time guy. And he'll play you know? more this year. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and, and you know, Joe's – they're going to hit a bunch of big pass plays, which means you can rack up big chunk yards. I mean, you got to remember, like, you look at Tennessee's running attack last year, and, of course, Hendon, you know, provided his little dynamic. But, like, you know, Wright almost got to 1,000. Jabari had his year. But Dylan Sampson had 500 yards last year. Yeah. I mean, like, it's not like he was some, you know, got 180 Dylan, yards. I mean, Dylan like, Sampson averaged over six yards a pop. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, like, you know, there's going to be one of the one or two of those games where – Squirrel gets for, you know, 160 yards because he caught three passes or two passes. So, yeah, I would go over there. James Pierce, five and a half sacks. Two two unknown. Right now, it's the under, but only because there's just unknown. He could go for 12 sacks and it wouldn't phase me. He could get three and it wouldn't phase me. I don't think any of us know enough to say one way or the other. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Jalen Wright's 11 and a half touchdowns. I'll say the under only because I, I, I think that he could lead the team in rushing and lead the team in carries. But for some reason, man, they always put in Jabari when you're in the red zone and Jabari goes in and scores those touchdowns. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go under on that too. Oh, I'm for sure going under just because I, I think, I think a lot of those guys are going to play. I, I don't know that anybody's getting 12. That's, I mean, that's a big, that's a pretty big number. Okay, here, you're going to knock on wood right here. This one, I think, is the easiest one. Just just on special teams alone, Aaron Carter, total tackles, 30 and a half. Scream the over. Yeah, I agree with that. And then uh, team defensive turnovers forced, 22 and a half. I believe Tennessee last year, don't quote me, I think Tennessee had 22 last year that it forced. Maybe I know, I'm off. I know they had 11 interceptions because I just – Got done using that stat, and, yeah, in a story. So that I mean, that sounds very feasible. I'll go over. I'll, I'll say that they they force more than twenty two turnovers of uh, this football season. I, I just think they're more talented, and when you put more talent on the field, then that, yeah. that normally equates to that, right? I agree. Got a couple more here. We'll go to uh, Trillville 7. June and July are now over to the Vols land their fair share of big boy battles that they needed to, in your opinion. Yeah, they did. I mean, they, they, I think they missed on a couple um, that I thought that they were, you know, had a good chance to get. Ronan O'Connell, I thought, would end up here, and he, you know, ended up going to Clemson. I thought Braylon Russell would end up here, um, you know, and that ended up getting kind of flipping late, um, you know. But, you know, they, they, they got Bennett Warren done. That's a massive need. They got Mike Matthews done, Spillman. I mean, you, you know, you go right down the list. I mean, Tennessee – won their fair share. Um, now they need to win their fair share the rest of the way. Again, it's, 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 it's to me, it's more about kind of always having some momentum instead of being like a, Oh, then they got five guys in a six day span and then they didn't get anything for three months. I think you'd rather kind of keep, you know, like, let's say they, you know, they, let's say they, let's play devil's advocate and they, they got one area. Right. And then they had like a month and they got a Koye, you know, like it would almost feel like this, the momentum just kind of gets, keeps getting strung along. You know, maybe it's not one area, maybe it's someone else in that role or someone, you know, someone else for a Koye. But like, I think that's the big thing is, can you get your fair share from here to the house in December? Let's go uh, to Bill Lingvall. Um, What was the outlook after Peyton left in 97? Was anyone in the media picking the balls to repeat as SEC champions? Is there an opportunity for this year's team to capture some of that magic in 98? Uh, maybe be fighting for a playoff spot like last year. I think the biggest difference, Rob, and I understand the similarities and the parallels here. The biggest difference is, though I think this defense is going to be improved and is deeper and everything's going to take a step just like it did last year. Rob, this is not this is not the 98 defense. That 98 defense was incredible coming back. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no Al Wilson on on this team. I mean, that's an extreme example, but you know, yeah. that's a first round draft pick. I mean, Dwayne Goodrich at corner, Darwin Walker was, you know, an all all SEC. No, Ray Knock Thompson level player. Yeah, Ray Knock. At least not to this point where they've shown it. Yeah, where, where they've shown it consistently, and you know, and that 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 I, I just. I just know. I mean, I, the I don't think. The question so. is: It's when the twenty thirty eight season rolls around, Rob, and you and Hubs are like Ted Williams's head, you know, still covering the balls frozen over there. Like, will will people be saying feels like twenty <laughs> three? I, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. 
No, I mean, I, I think this team has a chance. I mean, I, th- I think 10 and 2, you know, maybe, you know, 11 and 1 would be phenomenal regular Good season <laughs> if, they, if they shock somebody. But I, I think, I think right now you're getting back to the, we're winning nine and 10 games is, you know, routine. And then I, I think, you know, I think the next step is out there and I think this program could make it, but I, I don't, I don't think this is that year. All right, last one. We will end on this one from Fort Loudon Vol. I was surprised to see Florida up to number three in the recruiting class currently, despite having a new coach, not having a great season. 16 of the 21 commits are from outside the state of Florida. Is this NIL, historic name recognition, or really just good recruiting by Billy Napier? I think some of it is um, good recruiting. I think some of it is some guys that probably have some overinflated rankings, which helps their overall ranking. Um, and you know, Florida's still a sexy brand. Why was Tennessee able to recruit well when they've been below average, you know, in, in Tennessee standards for the last 15 years? Uh, you know, because they're still Tennessee, Florida's still Florida, they're still a name brand. I mean, like, you know, and, and for kids, they know, you know, who you know, Florida is. Like, I mean, that's the thing you got to remember. I mean, a lot of Tennessee fans will say, Well, I mean, Florida didn't get good till Spurrier, okay, but like. You know, that's not, I mean, when Spurrier got there, it was 30 years ago. It wasn't like it was three years ago. So, like, you know, Florida has still got a lot of name recognition. So, I mean, they're going to recruit well. Even if it's from outside the state of Florida, they, they still have enough recognition to garner attention from recruits. And right now, they offer the same thing that Tennessee offered all those years, which is opportunity. And there's going to be a whole lot of opportunity down in Gainesville, that is for sure. All right, everybody, appreciate you sending in those questions. And uh, every single week right here on Thursday, VolQuest.com, it's presented by our friends, Exterior Home Solutions, for our free estimates, renovation, roofing, siding, windows, whatever it is. You can give them a call at 865-524-5888 or visit them online, ExteriorHomeSolutions.com. Camp is going on right now. We've got so much coverage over at VolQuest.com. And if you're listening to this podcast and you're not a member of VolQuest.com, I'm not sure what you're waiting on. Incredible promo deal right now for camp. It's not going to be here long, but $1 for one month or 25% off your first year of your annual subscription. Take advantage, strike while the iron's hot, and join us over at VolQuest.com. Uh, Brent Hose is here, then he left. Rob Lewis, Austin Price, I am Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys for being here, and have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody. 